Hi everybody, my name is Hannah and this is Pepper and Pine and today I want to share with you the books and resources that we are using for our Middle Ages unit. I have a ton of resources to share with you today from books to kits to projects to activities. So this is going to be a really lengthy video but you can find all of the information down in the description box below for all of the materials that we're using as well as vendors that I love to shop from for our homeschool. All right, so I have a lot of things I want to show you today as well as how I choose the books that we're going to use for our history units and how I am lesson planning this time around for this unit. This is the third time that we are doing this main lesson block. And so as well as showing you the resources that I'm going to be using, I can tell you a little bit about the books that we have used in the past and how we like them. I'm also going to show you some of the new materials that we got for this year. All right, but the first thing I want to show you is this really awesome castle building kit. This is a medieval castle building kit by Brick and Build. I'm not sure if it's still available, but it is an awesome kit. We've used it now several times, so we have some old bricks that we have already made, but basically comes with a single mold, but we've since purchased three kits, and you can make these bricks and build uh, castles with them. Uh, now, we ran out of the uh, the material that came with the kit, the plaster. So we went ahead and bought some new plaster and we mixed some black ink in order to get those gray bricks. But it comes with all the materials that you need in order to do this project. All right, so uh, this is a super awesome kit and I realized that this may not be available. And so if there's a way for you to find these molds, then you could create your own castle uh, which is a lot of fun to construct and build and you will need some really durable adhesive in order to keep these blocks together. So this is one of our favorite kits for this unit and we have made this several times and so our castle keeps growing every time we do this unit. All right, so before we dive into all of the books and resources, I want to show you how I'm lesson planning for this unit. I have my composition book here that I have just quickly written out the things that we want to do. Now up here I have that it's scheduled for six to eight weeks. But once you see all the materials that we have, that is definitely going to change. It's gonna be more like 10 to 12 weeks. Something else is that we are loosely using our live education Waldorf curriculum, and it's in here. I wanna show that to you really quickly so you can get a better idea of how we're breaking up this unit. This is the Middle Ages main lesson book. This is the book that a teacher will use in order to create the lessons for a main lesson block. This is Waldorf inspired education and this I think is scheduled for about six to eight weeks but I felt like the Silk Road and the Golden Age of Islam needed its own unit and so what I'm doing is I'm working to make my own main lesson block for the Silk Road which will be completely separate from our Middle Ages unit in that I will have a separate video to show you the resources that I'm using, but definitely they overlap because it's the same time period. So this main lesson book is going to have all of the lessons that you need. You don't really need any additional resources, but I am way too excited to not gather other resources in order to put this main lesson block together or this unit study together. So I will definitely use this as a guide, but I'm going to be using all of these resources within that main lesson block. All right, so what I did here was I wrote down uh, my plan and some of the activities and projects that I want to do. You can find this information on my website at pepperandpine.com. There are screenshots and photos of everything uh, that I'm planning, the books and the resources, even links to some of the products that I'm using. I want to say right off the bat, though, that there are two vendors that I go to often for my materials. One of them is rainbowresource.com. The majority of these books and projects came from rainbowresource.com. A lot of the handwork and and other materials came from a childsdream.com. So both of those vendors are ones that we frequent often. This time around, I did make use of Amazon a little bit, but there, it's not generally my go-to place to buy homeschool material. So what I did for for our my initial lesson planning is that I wrote down some of the books that we're going to be using in the sense that they're the general category. So I've got my historical fiction. I've got my nonfiction history books. I have other nonfiction books, and then I have my picture books, and those are going to be my read-alouds. And not all of them are read-aloud picture books. Some of them are a little bit more in-depth, but I'm going to show you those and, and explain how I'm using them in our homeschool. I also decided to change the way I'm, I'm less 
lesson planning or the way I want to approach this main lesson block this time around, usually I will schedule the material that we want to cover within a day. And usually we set aside about two hours for a main lesson block. But I find that a lot of times that we will end up spending the whole day, little blocks of time here and there, just kind of working on it. And I want to be a little bit more intentional with the time that we are spending with our main lesson block main lesson block. So what I decided to do was to schedule two hours, maybe two and a half hours a day dedicated to the main lesson block. I've also decided to assign a lot more work to my 12 year old. So I should mention that this main lesson block generally comes in the sixth year for a Waldorf school, but sixth grade is more like seventh grade in traditional school because Waldorf students start at around seven for first grade rather than six for first for first grade. And so uh, my son is 12 years old, so this is a good time to do this main lesson block. And because he is such a great, voracious reader, I've decided to assign a lot more books for him to read, since I'm going to have a ton of books, rather than me spending so many hours every day reading these books aloud. My seven-year-old daughter is also going to participate in this main lesson block in the sense that she will be present for a lot of the oral lessons that we do. She may want to do a lot of the projects, but I won't require her to produce any work on her own the same way I would for my 12-year-old but she'll probably draw and write anyway. I'm just not gonna require it from her. Okay, so for here, for the books part, I am going to have a number of historical fiction that I'm gonna let my student choose which one he wants to read. He probably will get through most of them, but I want him to have just enthusiasm in choosing the books and enjoying reading those books because they're not as, as exciting as the books that he's getting from the library. And so uh, that's something else that we struggle with a lot in that we end up, my son loves to read books in the library. He'll read like 10 hours a day if he could. And so during these next eight weeks, I am not going to the library so that the books that he has to read are in our main lesson block. So <laughs> yeah, that's what we got to do. <laughs> All right, so nonfiction history books. So we're going to start out with the Kings of Britain. A History of the Kings of Britain. So I want to show you that book really quickly before we uh, move on to the other, uh, to the rest of the lesson plan. This book is like, I would place it at like high school level. And the content, I mean, I, upper high school. This is not an easy read by any means. Now I'm having my son read this right from the start as much as he can read every day, maybe 20 or 30 minutes, and then having him orally narrate back what he's read and then write a short summary of what he's read so that we can get some history content within this main lesson block. Because in general, when I do a history main lesson block or a unit study, I look at various things in order to build up that main lesson block or unit study. So I'll look for books on culture, geography, bo geography books, activity books, uh, kits and projects, picture books, uh, historical fiction, nonfiction books, books on uh, you know the culture, the belief system, the food, and the clothing. But what I've noticed is that sometimes we lack an actual history book so that we can actually know who did what when. Oh yeah, and um, biographies are uh, really good to add to uh, a history unit, which we have here, and I'll show you some. <clears throat> All right, so I'm starting out with this book so that we don't miss out on, you know, some of the things that we actually need to know about the history of the Middle Ages and not just the culture of the Middle Ages. All right, so then, and I'm going to assign that to my son just because I'm finding it a little bit challenging for me to read all of these books aloud. I do want to select certain books that I want to read aloud to him that are going to be interesting to my seven-year-old daughter as well. And I'm going to show you those in a minute. And then, so other nonfiction books, I'm going to show you those. They are in this stack somewhere. So I'll show you those a little bit later. Those in the past I've read aloud to my students. This time I'm going to assign my son to read them and then orally narrate them to my seven-year-old daughter. That's the plan. We'll see if it works. If not, I'll read them aloud. And then the picture books and other books that are similar to picture books that I either really like or that I'm interested in reading or that I think that my children will enjoy just kind of sitting next to me and reading, those ones I'm going to read aloud daily. For our activities, I have a cookbook that I am super, super excited to share with you. Uh, we're going to, what I, so what I, when I wrote this up, I 
said to myself, I want to review the recipes and choose one recipe a week to do with the kids. We also have act an activity book that I want to show you. I reviewed the activities and actually I have that later on in my lesson plan. I'm going to show you those. And then some games. And I only put 10 days across Europe. Oh, I forgot some other things here. Um, we want to make some finger puppets and peg dolls. Uh, 10 days across Europe. We also have our Professor Noggins game somewhere in all of this stuff. Our projects, the castle building kit, which you saw, and then a few other things here that I'm going to show you later on in this video, as well as our main lesson book. We also, uh, what I also did was in the activity book that I'm going to show you, I went through the entire activity book and chose way too many activities that I thought my kids would enjoy doing. I also labeled the page numbers and what material I needed to buy so that I'd be prepared for those projects and then I continued on this page and then I started to put together our m middle ages meal and either do it all on one day like on a Saturday and do something really extravagant with like soups and sauces and appetizers main courses and desserts or try one recipe a week I'm not sure we'll see how that goes all right so let me put that aside and dive into some of the materials that we're using I'm also going to show you how we're putting together our main lesson book the materials that we're using for that as well 10 days across Europe. This is the uh, first game I want to show you. This is not in any particular order, so I'm really sorry that I don't have more organization here, but there's a lot to get through. So let me just start and show you this, uh, this game. This is modern, this is a geography game that's going to show modern uh, geography. So this is not going to be Middle Ages geography, but I thought that this is going to at least help give a good visual for my children as we're going through and talking about these different areas. If they at least can get a grasp of where Germany is, where France is, where England is, then I think it's going to help them understand the, the content. So they just can have a visual of it. So I, I really, really enjoy the 10 days across games. They have them for all the different continents and we just really enjoy them a lot so we're going to definitely add that for this unit okay something I want to show you really quickly that we used to use in the past a lot that we haven't used so much anymore is the Osborne Encyclopedia of World History I really like these Osborne books they're really well done beautiful illustrations really great content but I just found that I wasn't using this as much in our history units just because I had so many other resources and this is like a complete history and usually when I'm putting together our history material it's more specific so I pulled this one out because I know that my son who is 12 really loves to read through these and it's just it's just a really great way to get a bird's eye view of the entire time period and I love all the illustrations so this is something that we're going to have out that I hope that he just picks up and reads when you know when he wants to I don't want to specifically assign these pages but I might we'll see castle this is like a really great beautiful book on how castles are built there's a lot of content that goes along with it and these really great ink or pencil illustrations we've done these before with some of our other units and i decided to add it for this unit too i've had this book for a long time but i have to say that it's not like our favorite resource but i'm definitely going to use it so this might be one that i read aloud to my children rather than have them go through it on their own this one, however, is a lot of fun. It's just, oopsies, really beautifully illustrated. And it's just, it's a lot of fun to read. Now, in the past, I've read this book aloud to my children. And I may do that again, or I may just have my son read it to himself or read it to my seven-year-old daughter. I'm not sure about some of these other resources. I definitely want them available to my children. I definitely want to encourage them to go through them and read them. And the ones that I really, really want them to read that they didn't read or don't plan to read, then I'll read them aloud to them because they will always sit for that. Okay, so let me show you some of the other resources that I have that aren't books. Story of the World. Actually, this is an audio version of the book by the same name. There are four volumes. It's by Susan Weisbauer. And I really like Susan Weisbauer's material, especially for her grammar and writing curriculum. We stopped using this resource as our history resource. For a couple of reasons, I do regret getting rid of the books. <laughs> I wish I had kept the books because they are super easy to read and they, again, give you a nice bird's eye view of the uh, of an entire historical time period. I did have some problems with some of the content is why we ended up going with something else. But at this point, I think I could filter through the content a little bit easier and kind of, you know, 
talk through the stuff that I didn't agree with with my children. But anyway, we are still going to use the audio because I noticed that my son, who is 12, loves to listen to audio. But lately, he's been listening to music rather than audiobooks when he's doing his math. And I would like to switch that up a little bit and have more content while he's he loves to listen to stuff while he's doing his math. So by the way, the math curriculum that we're going to be using during this unit is the key to geometry series as well as our mental math. And those are two things that we'll do before the main lesson. So um, you can also find the written version of that book. Okay, so um, also read by Jim Weiss, uh, because the this is read by Jim Weiss, who is an awesome storyteller. Uh, who in the world was the unready king? This is just going to go along with our material. It's something that we've listened to in the past that we've enjoyed. I love adding a variety of, of different resources to our unit so it's not just all books. All right, uh, this was a hand-me-down game that I got from some uh, an another homeschooler. I don't know how to play this game. We haven't played it yet, but it's for the Middle Ages, so I thought I would pull it out and have something to uh, as as our opening activities for this main lesson block, I thought that I would include games and, and other kind of fun things to do. So the way that we approach our main lesson block, or really our whole school day, is that we definitely like to try to have some opening activities. Uh, funny enough, they are not always the first thing that we do in the day, but they are just a great way to just kind of get into the main lesson. So, and for instance, if my son is going to be doing a lot of heavy reading, I want to balance that out with something that's a little bit more fun. And if he's doing something fun and I want to kind of invite him into the space of doing this main lesson block, then pulling out a game to begin with is a great way just to kind of invite the children in. And then you can proceed into something that's a little bit more challenging, a little more difficult. Uh, this is the Professor Noggins game. I love these games. I have them for so many of our units. And uh, <clears throat> they have these beautifully illustrated covers. And then on the back, there are two sets of questions, an easy set and a hard set. And what I've noticed for some of the content where we're super like clueless about, doing this game in the beginning doesn't work as well as doing it kind of midway through the unit when you have a little bit more information where you can answer the questions a little bit more easily. Because it's trivia based, you do need to have a little background information before you can answer these. Once we get into the unit and we learn, then we'll start out with the easy ones. And if I'm a lot more proficient than my children, I'll do the hard ones just to kind of balance it out because we just like to play games that way. And then at the end of the unit, we can test ourselves with the hard questions. So I really like these games for that reason. And I also really like them because they're just, they're super easy. They're super durable, by the way. Like home with toddlers, don't worry. Like these are going to last a lot better than like say some of these cars that are just way more uh, flimsy. Uh, so I really like the quality. I really appreciate products that are well made. And this is one of those things that I just, I really enjoy. All right, so uh, I have two books here that are like these pop-out books that just super fun to read. I try to have a variety of material for my main lesson blocks and unit studies because as most homeschooling families will know you have a variety of ages within your homeschool. And I know that when I'm doing a main lesson block for any one of my children, the other children are going to want to participate in whatever capacity they're able to. So having some material for my younger students has always proved to be beneficial when I'm doing these units. This is something that not just my younger children are going to enjoy, my older children are going to enjoy as well. So a lot of great content, a lot of like fun, interactive uh, pieces in this book and and don't underestimate the quality of the content. I find that these ones are really well written and that may come to us that may be surprising to you if you just you know have a limited amount to spend and you're like no I want to get like a more heavy you know history book you'll find that these ones are actually really good choices and they're so enjoyable as well. Okay we also have Life in a Castle. This one doesn't have any content. This one opens up uh, so that it, you, um, you do this to it. And while it does, oh, you can't see that at all. Let me just, I use one of these clips to keep it together. It worked better than the string that comes with it. And then you have like all of these different sections to play with. And this is super, super exciting and fun for my children. My younger child really, really likes this a lot. She'll spend hours and hours playing with it. Okay, a little bit of content, not much. Okay, so 
Um, you can find these three-dimensional books in other categories as well, but I'm really glad that we have it for this unit. Okay, so let's move on to this stack right here. And I, these next three books, they're, they're not really categorized. Uh, we don't usually use workbooks in our homeschool. And so when we do use them, it's quite a novelty and my kids get really excited about it, but we rarely, rarely use workbooks. And so I, I actually, I don't remember when and where I got this from. It might have been from Rainbow Resource and I do get overzealous when I'm putting together a unit and I'll buy like half of what I see <laughs> that's related to that unit. So that, that may have been why I got this or it could have been hand-me-down. I really don't remember. But here's the thing is that sometimes I need something that my children can do that I don't need to be involved in because I might be helping another student or I'm just not prepared for that day. These come in so beautifully. I decided to go ahead and photocopy the parts that I needed. And that's because I realized that because I'm doing these units every three to four years. I regret that I didn't do that earlier on and then I might not be able to find that same resource again or I'm putting together the unit and then last minute I realize, oh, this all these pages have been ripped out and been used or they're already written in. So I decided to go ahead and photocopy those from now so that I could keep this intact for the next time we do this unit. It also comes with some information that the children can read and then answer the questions. And the reason why I don't typically use these is that I am... I kind of waver on whether there's a lot of academic uh, benefit to reading something and then answering questions where you're just like kind of flipping back and you're like, oh, where's the answer for that? And anyway, I prefer not to use that kind of mode of education in our homeschool. However, the reason why I find it beneficial at this point is that my son who is 12 is taking standardized tests with his homeschool and he will need to in the future. So I think this is good test prep for him. At least that's my thought process. Okay, um, I have another workbook that I picked up from the library bookstore. And I got this because it had so many things that we were going to be studying. But this, I believe, is high school level. I don't necessarily intend to give this to my child. I, I'm using this more a little bit as a resource. I found some information on the Silk Road and different Islamic notable figures of that time that I didn't know about. So I wanted to do some of my personal research on this and then maybe draw from this uh, workbook for some activities that I felt like maybe my son would benefit from a Venn diagram or uh, the T diagram for comparing and contrasting since we don't typically use those in our homeschool. The next book is also from the library bookstore. It's called Crafts and Culture of a Medieval Guild. And since we're going to be talking about this in our homeschool for, for this particular unit, I thought this would be a good resource as well. This is definitely a book that you can just pick up from the library, but I also liked it because it had a couple of projects in. I love projects, and so that's why I picked this one up. I don't know much about it since we haven't read it yet. It doesn't seem like a super exciting book to read compared to the other ones that we have, but I went ahead and I picked it up anyway. It's only a quarter, guys. Can't miss up or, or pass up a, a, a good deal like that, right? Okay, so... The next set of books I want to show you are, uh, I believe these are all part of one set. And they are books in this medieval series. You can find all of these other ones. I don't know what the set is called. And I know that they are also so sold individually. I believe I bought them individually. They were about 7 or $8 a piece. We really, really liked these. These go through all these different aspects of the Middle Ages in this really nice compact book that is really beautifully illustrated and it has, I feel, just the right balance of content to illustrations. It's not too heavy. It's an easy read. You learn a lot when you go through them. So my only, the only downside is that we went through this entire series the last time we did this unit and I read all of these books aloud to my children and maybe it's because when I read aloud I don't retain the same information as when I when I read it silently I just felt like I forgot a lot of the information now that's just me as an adult reading it aloud to my children turns out my children retained way more information than I had expected that they would so you know that's just my own personal uh reflections on the material a, a greater part of it, I think has to do with the fact that when I read aloud, I just don't retain as much. All right. So uh, I'm just going to quickly go through the, the rest of the books. You can see that they're very similar in the way that they're set up with their illustrations and 
just the amount of content per page with the illustrations. Uh, I, I would think that you could read this to a child that's in first grade, you know, aloud, and they would get a lot of information out of it, and they would love to look at the pictures. And then you could assign this all the way up until, you know, I think even, you know, late junior high or even high school level for a, a student to read and then write about. So typically our main lessons include something that the student needs to write, a, a narration or dictation or copy work, as well as an illustration. Not an illustration for every single lesson, but we do add quite a few illustrations into our main lesson blocks and then a, a lot of writing. So that's something that uh, the kids can do with this. So let me just show you the last one. This is clothing in the Middle Ages. Last couple, medicine and medieval town and trade. So I really, really, really like these. If you were to get no other books for your Middle Ages unit, I would recommend these as well as a couple of games and one history book and you would be set. All right, let's move on to this stack of books here. And uh, this is actually kind of a variety of things, including some of my favorites. So uh, these two items we, we got when we went to go visit the Tower of London on a family trip uh, about a year ago. And so they're going to work perfectly now with this unit. And it's cute. It's a little pop-up book. And also it works great that we've actually visited uh, castles <laughs> so that my children now have just a visual you know an experience uh, you know being there uh here i have a, a couple thoughts on that and then i want to show you this book there once was a man with six wives it's it's written like in a really kind of witty fun way but you may want to preview the content first because there was some things that i was like oh i'm not sure i want to really share that with my child at this point so this may not be suitable for young children so that's just you know something i want to put out there uh Sometimes I'll do a unit, I'm like, oh, it's such a bummer that we can't visit the pyramids or a castle or, you know, go out whale watching and when we're talking about like, you know, whales and being on the ocean and all these things. And I think, you know, there's enough information in the books and there's enough of imagination in my children that they can just, you know, uh, get enough out of it. And, and that is 100% true. But here's what you will not get out of a book. You won't get the feel the, you know, touching those things, the experience, the smell, and most importantly, especially with castles, just how big they are. When we went to go visit Notre Dame when we were in France, and you, it's huge on the outside, but it's even more magnificently huge on the inside because it's not like there are multiple layers in there. You walk in, and that space is tremendously high. You can't get that out of a book. You can't get that feel out of a book. So uh, that's just my two thoughts. <laughs> two thoughts, two cents <laughs> on, on that. All right, so let me show you these, um, some of the other projects that we have. This is a medieval letter set, and we will use this for <laughs> this unit. We've used this in the past, and I don't have a tremendous amount to say on it, except that I really, really like having a hands-on projects and different activities to coordinate with a main lesson block. So I, I do try to have quite a few of those. Uh, I have just some random things in here from various history time periods. A timeline I want to actually show you because this is going to be super helpful since there's a lot going on during the Middle Ages. And this one's called Timeline of Medieval Europe. We got this one from Rainbow Resource and it goes through Northwest, East, and can't read that Mediterranean I think it says okay so uh, that's also going to be good to have up so that you can refer to it as you're going through this unit especially since we that's our, our weak spot uh, when it comes to our history units okay so we have a couple of fun things for the kids again if you've got young children who are participating in a unit that you've designed for an older student then adding some of these fun activity books is going to be a winner this is a maze book and it's just a whole lot of fun we also have this one it's called castle mazes another fun one for the children and then we have one two three draw knights castles and dragons and this is going to be really helpful for us since we're going to be doing a lot of drawing with our 
our main lesson and so having a drawing book like this to help my students out is going to be really helpful so that they can be um, more satisfied with the work that they create okay let me show you these ones here this is a uh, a cookbook and I am super excited about this cookbook because we love to add cooking in our units even if it's not a history unit we'll try to find some way to add you know be in the kitchen for the unit in the past we have done uh, an ancient Egypt uh, ancient Roman ancient Greek meal and for that I used other resources that were designed for a school setting and so they weren't as authentic as I believe this one to be you can find those videos on my youtube channel I we've done a variety of them for these different history units however we have got I've gotten a lot of feedback from viewers saying all the things that I did wrong with those meals uh the materials that weren't available at the time uh you know or just cooking techniques that are modern that you know weren't available at the time especially a lot of the foods that just weren't introduced to those regions until much later so while i appreciate all of the historical accuracies and being authentic to that time period my main purpose in doing this is out of inspiration and enjoyment and uh, creativity it's it's not necessarily to be historically accurate and by the way those are some of my children's fondest memories in homeschool is when we went to the kitchen and did a, an ancient roman meal or an ancient greek meal so i'm really excited to introduce this book into our homeschool because this one is supposed to be super authentic it's called plain delight medieval cookery for modern cooks and i really like the introduction as well it really gives you a good overview of the how cooking was done uh you know people didn't cook in their homes they went to the the bakery that you know, for the whole town uh you know firewood was scarce or people just couldn't afford it or whatever it was i really like that kind of historical background and then of course it has all of these recipes and they're written in i guess old english <laughs> and then of course then it's it's translated and explained in you know modern english with all the measurements and everything i'm really super excited to do this with my children so want to share this book for you oh and this was recommended by a viewer so thank you for that recommendation design your own coat of arms this is going to be something that we will do twice i think once on paper and then once for a project that we want to do with like wood and actually make a sword and shield and then do our coat of arms and do one for our family in particular so i'm kind of excited about that we have some spare wood in the garage so i thought we could actually cut one out of real wood uh famous figures of medieval times this is movable paper paper figures to cut color and assemble this is going to be a lot of fun for my seven-year-old and then my 12-year-old will still enjoy doing these as well so i want to do this earlier on in our unit so that we can actually use these throughout the unit and have something that's just kind of fun and inspiring as we go all right so here is that awesome activity book that i had mentioned earlier this is called the days of knights and damsels this is an activity book by Lori carlson i have used her books so many times with our different units these are awesome activity books in part because they're they're super easy to follow they have a just the right amount of information for the project as well as before each section a little bit more information about say food or clothing so that you have a little bit of context for the project and then what's really awesome is that the materials are things that you can probably find around your house or purchase for really cheap so for instance this marvelous marzipan you're not even using real mar marzipan which may be difficult for you to find in some areas so there's a great alternative here and i really like these shortcuts because it allows you to do these projects really simply and get the value of the project without being super stringent on being super accurate <laughs> and authentic uh, if you want to be more authentic to the time period absolutely you may do so but for young children i feel like the experience is more valuable than the accuracy in my opinion so uh so that we're definitely going to do a lot of activities out of this book so i've already written them down in my where, where did i put it here it is <laughs> in my composition book here and uh, I just wrote down 
all of the things that we wanted to do, all the page numbers, and all of the materials that I thought that we would need. I want to start on these as soon as possible because some of these projects take a while to do, and having at least one thing to work on every day in the afternoons is going to work really well for us. That's something else I wanted to say. Our main lesson block, we're setting aside two to two and a half hours for that, but I want to set aside about an hour to two hours in the afternoon to do the projects and the handwork that's not just going to enhance the main lesson block, but it's also going to be good for my children's gross and fine motor skills as well as other developmental um, benefit benefits. Okay, so before we move on to other resources, I want to show you the main lesson book that we're going to use. These are main lesson books that I have created myself using drawing paper, some high quality construction paper. I took all of these. These were in really large sheets. I took them all to a local office supply store. I want to say it was office max or office depot i can't remember you can get these cut down to size you can see how perfectly they're cut when i use my paper trimmer they're all like just a hair off and so if you want this to be perfectly cut and super easy because it only takes like five minutes take it over to your office supply store it generally costs a dollar per cut so they'll just line everything up they'll cut everything and then you can bind it with as many pages as you want these ones have a lot more pages than a typical main lesson book is going to have but i wanted um some larger main lesson books for this unit because I know that we're going to be covering it for several weeks and I just wanted enough pages. There's two different kinds of bindings that you can get. I think this is the comb binding. This is the spiral binding. I prefer the spiral binding because you can open up your book completely like this and put it down. I don't think you can do that as easily with this one. You can see that it, it, it does that. So that's just two, um, two little tips there on you know DIY in your own main lesson books. The red one will be for our Middle Ages unit, and this beautiful orange one is going to be for our Silk Road unit. All right, also we're going to be using our Lyra color pencils for our drawings. I want to show you what these look like. They have a nice assortment of colors. And I usually take these out and I put them in our own pencil case that I made out of felt, but we decide just to leave these ones in uh, in the case for now, but I will eventually transfer them. And then we're also going to be using our fountain pen for, uh, for all the written work, and you can find these at achildsdream.com. Okay, so let's move on to some of the other resources that I have. The Waldorf Book of Poetry, this one's going to come in handy for a lot of different main lesson blocks that you choose to do if you want to add poetry into your main lesson blocks. I want to show you that it, for this particular one, it goes through so many different subjects and there's one just on history so I went over to that one and I just kind of flagged that whole section I may only do one or two of these poems because none of them really resonated with me but at least I have that here so that I can add that in uh, if we decide to do that so I wanted to show you that one I really like the way that it's organized all right so let's go on to my favorite books these are the you wouldn't want to be books these are by scholastic and i love these books and i'm surprised that i love them because the illustrations are really not my thing but i love them because the content is really well done it's minimal it's easy to understand you learn a lot when you're done reading this book and the little captions with the illustrations are super funny and witty and it's just really captivates your students and you as an adult so you end up learning a lot. It's a fun read. It's fun to look at. And it's kind of done in a, a kind of a lighthearted way. So I really, it's a game changer when it comes to boring history texts. So I love these books. So we got You Wouldn't Want to Be in a Medieval Dungeon. You Wouldn't Want to Work on a Medieval Cathedral. And You Wouldn't Want to Be a Crusader. And You Wouldn't Want to Be Joan of Arc, which I'm thinking this is more like... I can't remember the time period. I think we don't need this one for this particular unit. I have to look through that because I can't remember. Oh no, 1428. So just the tail end of the Middle Ages. All right, so I highly recommend these books. These are some of our favorites. I try to find them for all of the units that we're doing. I highly recommend them. This is a new book for us. Oh, and I want to say that I have not read these books. I've read other ones, but I haven't read these ones in particular because they're new for this unit. Archer's 
alchemists and 98 other medieval jobs you might have loved or loathed this looked like a fun read it seems like it's kind of like an additional resource for a middle ages unit something that's kind of like extra and superfluous but i'm hoping that it's going to be fun and just kind of give us like a nice overview of the different jobs that were around during the middle ages also has some fun, fun illustrations but i can't tell you much about this book yet because we haven't read it these two books were gifted to me from Shalise over at Sobbuster Living. I encourage you to check out her channel. She's here on YouTube and on Instagram. And she gave me these two books. They're beautiful picture books. Therese makes a tapestry and Marguerite makes a book. I haven't read this one yet, but we've read this one and I love it. It is a really nicely well done book. And it it's... Um, it's from, it's it based on a ch uh, girl, a child. And I, I find that I know things are changing. You can find a lot more resources on women in the past, but I find that, that that's still like an under, uh, uh, underrepresented section in history, especially since a, a, a lot more of the historical figures that you're going to read about are men. So I'm really, really happy to have this, especially since my daughter is seven. But also, especially if you have boys, it's important to have a good collection, a good balance between female figures in history as well as, as male figures in history. So we read this this whole book and we actually visited the castle of Versailles. So I'm like, oh, let's look back at our pictures and see if we actually saw it. But no, this tapestry that this book is actually based on is at the Getty Museum, which is within driving distance for us. So I'm super excited to go there and check out this, uh, this tapestry. So it turns out that these books are actually uh, Getty publications. So I'm guessing that this book, whatever uh, book it was used to inspire this is probably at the Getty Museum. I'm not sure, but I'm really excited to add these two books into our main lesson block, especially because they're picture books and that's always going to be fun for the kids and also because it has a female character. I'm going to go through this next stack as quickly as I can because these are all the um, partially historical fiction and partially just history books. So I have a lot of historical fiction for this unit and my son will go through however many books he wants. He's already read many of these and I'm gonna show you, share with you the ones that we like that we've read before. This is the history of the Kings of Britain. This is not a historical fiction. This is a, a much more heavy read and I would generally read this ahead of time and then present the lessons to my children. It's a great resource for adults, but I'm having him read it because I think he can be challenged that way with his, his books because he reads a lot of element, upper elementary books that are super easy to read that he can read like a book in a day and he needs to be a little bit more challenged. All right. So the son of Charlemagne, this book was actually a really good historical fiction that we read several years ago. And oops, here we go. I want to make sure that I had this for when I showed you the 12 bright trumpets. Um, this I read aloud to my children this time and assign it to my, to my 12 year old. This is another good one that we read in the past. It's called Matilda Bone. I can't remember exactly what it was about. Maybe it was about like a healer. I don't remember, but what I, but it was a good book in that it gave it, we read about like medicine and we read about, um, like the castles and uh, the plague. And we read about all of these different topics in the Middle Ages, but when it really made sense to us and it, we really understood it was when we read a historical fiction about it so if you even didn't have the other books that i mentioned earlier they're like these are awesome you know have these in a couple of games and you'll be set even if you didn't have those if you had some of these historical fiction i think that you would get a, a an even better grasp of what it was like to live at that time, what it was like to live through the plague, what it was like to live as a peasant, what it was like to live as a king. Like, I think these are going to do a really good job doing that. So definitely recommend this book. Castle Diary, I definitely recommend this book too. I read this aloud the last time we did our unit and I re we really enjoyed it. Fire, Bed and Bone. This is told by the viewpoint of the dog, I believe. And I think it was during the plague. This was an awesome book. Really well done. Really captured the whole uh, f feeling and the intensity of the plague at the time. The Knight's Castle, I cannot remember if I read this book to the kids or not, but I have it here to to give to them. Totally, I don't think historically um, accurate exactly, but still a fun read that I think will coordinate with this unit. Robin Hood, I haven't read this particular version of it, but again, time period, I think even maybe even 
more like renaissance i can't remember this is terrible that i can't remember but anyway uh this time period or late middle ages uh the story of johann gutenberg this is uh, a little short book on him i uh, can't remember if we read this one or not i am so sorry i think we got this right after we had finished our unit and maybe i read it to the kids i don't remember but it but i definitely would have a book on the printing press we also have the an audio version it's not by the same i don't think it is nope it's not it's not by the same author uh this is just a a, a different uh audio version of the book read or yeah read by jim weiss and so again if we can add audio into our units that's always a good thing crown and jewel i do not know about this book this was gifted to me by shalice over at sod buster living as well as this book called two collars and so i do not know about these books yet but i'll probably just assign these to my child and by assign them to my child i just mean that i'll have all of these non uh his, these historical fiction available for him and he can pick and choose and just read the ones that excite him first uh, this book, English History Stories, this one I picked up from the library bookstore. This was written, I think, in like 1901, and I have not read it yet, but I think this is just going through different historical figures of the, the time period, I think from the year 1000 or 800 on. So I'm, I may read this one aloud to my child. I don't know that he will read it, and plus it's an antique, so I want him to be really super careful with it. Cities of Gold and Isle of Spice. Actually, I think this is probably for our Silk Road unit. So uh, this will make another appearance in that unit. And this one we picked up from the library bookstore. I don't know much about it, but I definitely want to add that to our unit. Uh, the Canterbury Tales. And this is <laughs> the uh, original unabridged version. It was really, really difficult for me to read this aloud to my children the last time we did this unit. It just was hard for me. I, it's a, this is a thick book. It's just a lot of stuff. This is, I think, high school level. So I will allow my son, or rather just, you know, provide it for my son if he wants to read it. If he doesn't want to read it, that's okay. I'm not going to be flustered over it. I do not want to read an abridged version of it, though, because I think that the quality of the language is really good in the original text. I just think it's a little bit hard to get through. Twelve Bright Trumpets. This book actually came with this learning guide and it comes with did it just come with these questions yeah i feel, I, I can't remember if there was more to this or not i I'm, I'm really sorry i don't know if there were other like written in worksheets that were available but uh there were these different questions and just kind of like a nice study guide to go along with the book i think we like this book i apologize for not remembering but anyway another book that i will be assigning to my son okay so uh these books were handed down within our homeschooling community i want to say they were part of book shark but i can't say for sure so we have um catherine called birdie uh i would put that at like say upper elementary read the great and terrible quest probably the same age group maybe fifth grade on uh, i believe this was part of a series here this is the youngest templar we have book one two and three again i think kind of uh upper elementary we have uh, the hidden treasure of glaston and i don't know much about this one unfortunately so these are all just historical fictions that i will just have available for my son the Shakespeare Stealer, he's reading this one right now. Super easy, fast read. Some of these, I mean, not more than a couple of days if you've got like a a voracious reader. Uh, the King's Shadow, Crispin, The Cross of Lead, and A Proud Taste for Scarlet and Miniver. Okay, so let's move on to some of our hand projects. All right, so I want to show you some of the projects that we have, handwork, as well as different kits and, and projects that the kids are going to do. This is called, uh, like, it's a medieval uh, herb garden. We got this years ago. I went ahead and kept the whole entire thing, but we're out of the 
the soil and the herbs, the seeds and stuff, but we're just going to go ahead and, and use the seeds that we have. It does list the ones on the back here that were uh, possibly available at the time. Gosh, now I can't see where it is. Okay, here it is. Rosemary, parsley, basil, thyme, chives, fennel, dill, and marjoram. So we'll go ahead and just plant whatever we've got, but it's, you know, a super cute project. You could definitely do this on your own. You don't need to buy the kit, but you know, the kit was nice. Um, marbling, we are, we have this kit here and I think it just mostly comes with the different paints. We're going to do a marbling project as part of this unit and maybe even add it to our book binding project so that we, whatever we marble, if we do it with fabric, then we can use that to uh, be the fabric cover to the book that we want to bind. We want to make our own book. We also... Uh, have some calligraphy material here uh, and you know we we I wasn't quite sure how I want to add the calligraphy in but I'm thinking it might be nice to do the calligraphy for the titles of each of our main lessons for the written portion and that might be a nice way to incorporate it in a more organic fashion we also have these uh, I don't remember what they're called but to seal the envelope so we may do that in some parchment uh, I'm going to save this for you in just a minute so I can show you the other stuff first. We also want to do some candle dipping. And so for that, we do a lot of candle dipping and candle making anyway, but we have this pot for candle dipping. It's nice and tall, which allows you to get some nice uh, stick candles. And this is what they would look like when you're done. You just kind of dip them like this. You don't have to do them with you know two strings you can do them like single you can also use a tin can that's really tall and put it in a in a pot of water if you don't want to buy the materials in order to do candle dipping uh, you can also buy the wicks i've used in the past just some baker's twine so you don't have to buy the waxed uh twine you can also just use baker's twine i want to show you my favorite beeswax oh, smells amazing this is like by far the best beeswax i've ever gotten and we've tried maybe about four or five different kinds this one is topanga quality raw filtered bees best quality um and it's by bennett's honey farm this is uh right outside of like los angeles i believe by far the best quality beeswax in that it really smells just wonderful it has this light honey scent it does not have a chemical scent it melts really well it burns really well when you burn them they smell amazing so really good quality i am excited to use that again when we do our candle dipping i wanted to share with you that particular one that we just really really love okay uh let me show you these three different projects here now oopsies sorry We've done these in the past. We've done the a catapult and a trebuchet now twice in the past. This is our third time doing this unit. And so uh, some of them, you know, are more durable and they last longer and some of them kind of break apart. They, The catapult and the trebuchet, these two we've used in the past. They are fantastic quality, but they will break over time. I just want to let you know that they're not going to be durable forever, especially if you've got boys in the house that are actually using this. Uh, but because they are made of wood, they are more easy to fix if they do break. We do have one that is made out of plastic, which I don't recommend. Uh, but the ones that are made out of wood, we've really been pleased with. So we have these two, but I didn't know that they had a uh, siege engine, siege tower. And so I'm super excited to try this one. So this is new for us this time around cannot wait to do this one i mean i can't wait for my kids to do this one <laughs> and then uh these two are repeats of ones that we've done in the past we like them so much so i highly recommend these three products your children will love them you'll love them too all right so i'm down to the last thing that i want to show you and oopsies gosh not enough room here these are all the handwork projects that we are going to be doing for this unit. I want to show you uh, two different looms that I have. This one is a lap loom. It's made of nice quality wood. 
and it's just it seems like it's gonna be really easy to use this was a hand-me-down from a friend so I haven't actually used this one before we definitely want to do some weaving for this unit if you do not want to invest in a in an actual loom you can make your own out of cardboard whoopsies let me adjust this <laughs> you can make your own out of cardboard i have a tutorial on how to make these and then you can get just the whole function of doing some weaving without buying a, a big weaver if you just want to get the experience of it and not invest in in a loom okay so i have just a couple more things here to show you that i'm super excited to add to this unit you can add these to multiple units it doesn't just have to be a middle ages unit i think these things will work well for uh, any time from about fourth grade on. Okay, so we have some embroidery that we're going to do. And so these uh, embroidery rings you can get from any kind of craft store, and then you can use some embroidery floss. So I have them in three different sizes. In the book that I showed you earlier, the activity book, it has a great DIY uh, embroidery ring that you can make using like a, a tub, like a like a butter tub or a yogurt tub and just taking off like the top part, which is super cool if you don't wanna get one of these. Great upcycling project. This is the loom that we've had for so many years and, and, and a weaving project that we started years and years and years ago. So I'm really excited to either complete this one or just start all over with a new project. And then we have uh, our drop spindle that we also started and we you take your wool and you can turn it into yarn it's kind of challenging but it's a great project to do just to get an idea of how difficult it was to actually have clothing and how how much time it took to make the clothing and how much care they took to maintaining the clothing so that you know they they would have it for a long period of time uh then we also want to do some knitting and want to use as much undyed yarn as possible because we actually want to dye our own yarn and fabric. So I wanted to show you these two kits that we have not used yet, but I am just really excited about them. We have the Indigo Dye Kit, and it comes with almost everything you need to do the project. It is missing, uh, I think, lye. I think it's missing that. And so it has everything else that you're going to need in order to do this project. I'm really, really excited about the indigo, indigo dye. And then there's this botanical dye kit that has, I think, all these different natural materials in order to do natural dyes. And I'm also really excited about that, as well as just trying our hand at our own natural dyes using avocado skins and onion skins and turmeric and other things that we can find and see how, it, how we can dye our material with those things. And then we have some undyed fabric here. This I believe is just cotton and this is silk. I think, yeah, this is silk and this is wool. And all of these things are from a child's dream and I'm excited to do these projects with the kids because I'll be honest, I had this the last time we did the Middle Ages unit four years ago and we didn't use it then. So it's been in my homeschool for four years. Yeah, just being honest about that. Okay, and the last thing I want to show you are these dowels. And I have these so that we can DIY our own knitting needles. I learned how to do this from a Waldorf teacher who shared this project with us at a local uh, Waldorf conference recently. And so I'm really excited to try this out. It's super easy to do, and I think it'll be really nice that the kids can make their own knitting needles. And then you just can add like some polymer clay at the end and bake on some little ends so that your projects don't fall off. Okay, so I think that was everything. Thing. <laughs> if I did forget anything that I want to share with this unit, you can certainly find it on my website at pepperandpine.com. You can find more information about the resources that I am using down in the description box below. You can find a complete list of everything that we're using as well as my lesson plans on my website at pepperandpine.com. And don't forget, if you want to see how our homeschool is progressing on a daily basis, you can find me on Instagram at pepperandpine.